but if you haven't been able to find um, a worm, it's a little early yet, and that's okay. Uh, you'll still be able to, to learn alongside of us. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, I'm seeing some familiar names from some of our other virtual agronomy lessons that we've done before. And I know we have some new people joining us today. So it's very exciting to see where everybody is coming from across the state. And um, it's just fun to, to get together like this and, and learn about agronomy. And I'm not sure why my screen went blank. There we go, we're back in session. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Amy Nelson, for those I haven't met, and I work as a 4-H extension educator out of Waseca County. So we're um, South Central Minnesota, about an hour and a half south of the cities. Um, and we like to say that we're an ag country, so it's exciting to be part of, part of the agronomy team and um, teaching kids about all the different aspects of agronomy, um, which could include uh, crops, plants and soil science, vegetable gardening. Uh, we cover a lot in agronomy, and today we're gonna talk about worms. Um, and uh, you might not know some of our facts that we're gonna share, and some you might know, um, but there's definitely a lot to learn about worms, and I am by no means, uh, worm expert and I'm still learning um, right up until the time this webinar started I was learning about worms um, so we'll share our information with you and then um, we'll have some time at the end that we can talk about if you're interested in learning more uh, maybe how to turn turn this into a 4-H project and into a exhibit that you can take to the county fair um, and uh, give you guys a little hands-on activity to do along with us so again welcome to Worm Wednesday uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with 4-H, uh, we are an out-of-school time program and it fits a variety of backgrounds, interests, budgets, and schedules. Um, so you'll find 4-H sometimes in school, um, but a lot of times you'll find 4-H after school. Um, we do clubs, we do camps. Um, we, we, we're a positive youth development program um, that's in every community, every county in Minnesota. Um, and it's led by 4-H uh, extension educators like Brian and Kirsten and myself. Um, and we also work with other educators in extension um, about their knowledge and we like to take that knowledge out to the kids of Minnesota, so to say. So 4-H is a program for kids where they can learn and grow and do all sorts of neat things like what we're gonna do today. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to put your name and county in the chat box, you can go ahead and do that now. Um, and our um, helpers, Brian and Kirsten, will get those chats and we'll see where everybody's joining from. Um, if you've ever been to a 4-H meeting or activity, you know that we start with the 4-H pledge. Um, and so we're gonna do that today as well. It's up on the screen. Um, so go ahead and say the pledge along with us as we get started today. So I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, my health to better living. For my family, my club, my community, my country, and my world. And if you're joining us from a different state other than Minnesota, uh, you might notice that we put the word family in our pledge and not all states do that. Um, so that's kind of unique to us here in Minnesota. Um, and this pledge that all of our 4 hers say, it's the, as true today as the day when it was first created. Um, and again, 4-H is just about learning and growing. And that's what we hope you guys have a chance to do today. I also wanna give just a quick reminder about um, online meeting etiquette. As you know, um, when we're face to face, uh, we, we want you guys to be respectful participants. And the same goes when we're in an online setting such as this. Um, so please keep your microphone on mute. Um, you can use the chat box to answer questions or to ask your questions. Brian and Kirsten will get those questions and then let me know if there's questions I can answer. So um, we don't want you to miss out on any of our agronomy fun. Um, so we just ask that you be respectful participants um, today as we move forward. So let's get started learning about worms. Um, one quick reminder for supplies, but again, if you weren't able to find um, some of the things, that's okay too. We will move alongside with that. Um, I do wanna share a couple fun facts about worms, um, things that you might not know. Um, for one thing, worms don't have lungs like you and I do, um, but instead they breathe through their skin. Um, so they like soil that's moist because that helps them breathe in a little bit better. 
Uh, they also don't have ears, um, but they feel sound through their whole body. So they use their whole body to be able to, to hear sound. Um, in the world, there's over a million different kinds of worms, and there's over 2,700 different kinds of earthworms. Um, there's some worms that do some really great things, like the redworms we're going to talk about that can be used for composting, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but there's also some harmful worms um, that kind of make things not grow the way they should and cause some damage. Um, and earthworms are one of those things that do cause some damage. So um, we're seeing more jumping earthworms in Minnesota um, in places like Rochester, the Twin Cities. I think Winona was another place. Um, so these worms are a little bit different than our earthworms. They kind of look and act like little snakes. So they don't necessarily inch along like um, our redworms do, but they more kind of slither like a snake. Um, and they start to, to do some damage to the ground that they live in. Um, so while, while um, there's some worms that do some good things, there's some that don't do some good things as well. Um, and we're gonna um, talk about the parts of the worm so we can identify um, if you're interested in learning more about, you know, what kind of worms are not helpful, um, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go in. Um, but worms like to live where there's food, moisture, oxygen, and a favorable temperature. So if you weren't able to find a worm to observe today, um, it might just be because it's still too cold yet, or maybe um, there's not enough moisture, but yesterday's rain certainly helped. So it's probably more of a temperature thing. Okay, um, I'm going to share a, a little story with you guys, a book that um, my kids and I like. It's called The Diary of a Worm, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, maybe. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing where I can stop sharing. I just see a button there. We'll do pause, share, stop, share. There we go. Um, so if I'm small on your screen, if you go kind of towards the top, you should see what's called a speaker view. And then that should put me a little bit bigger if you can, but I'll try and hold the, the book up as best as I can so you can see the, the neat pictures in the book. But this book is called Diary, Diary of a Worm and it is by Doreen Cronin. Okay. The Diary of a Worm, March 20th. Mom says there are three things I should always remember. Number one, the earth gives us everything we need. Number two, we dig tunnels, or when we dig tunnels, we help take care of the earth. And we never bother daddy when he's eating the newspaper. So this worm doesn't read the newspaper, he eats the newspaper. March 29th, today I try to teach Spider how to dig. First of all, his legs got stuck. Then he swallowed a bunch of dirt. Tomorrow, he's going to teach me how to walk upside down. March 30th, worms cannot walk upside down. The fourth, the fishing season started today. We all dug deeper. April 10th, it rained all night and the ground was soaked. We spent the entire day on a sidewalk. Hopscotch is a very dangerous game. April 15th, I forgot my lunch today. I got so hungry that, that I ate my homework. My teacher made me write, I will not eat my homework 10 times. When I was finished, I ate that too. April 20th, I snuck up on some kids in the park today. They didn't hear me coming. I wiggled right up between them and they screamed. I love when they do that. May 1st, Grandpa taught us that good manners are very important. So today I said, good morning to the first aunt I saw. There were 600 more of them in line. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning, good morning. I stood there all day. May 8th, had the worst nightmare last night. Giant birds playing hopscotch. Mom says I have to stop eating so much garbage right before I go to bed. That's what's causing the nightmares. May 15th, I got into a fight with Spider today. He told me, you need legs to be cool. Then he ran. I couldn't keep up. Maybe he's right. 
May 16th, I made Spider laugh so hard, he fell out of his tree. Who needs legs? May 28th, last night, I went to the school dance. You put your head in, you put your head out, you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourselves about. That's all we could do in that song. June 5th, today we made macaroni necklaces in art class. I brought mine home and we ate it for dinner. June 15th, my oldest sister thinks she's so pretty. I told her that no matter how much time she spends looking in the mirror, her face will always look just like her rear end. <laughs> Spider thought that was really funny. Mom did not. July 4th, when I grow up, I want to be a secret service agent. Spider says I will have to be very careful because the president might step on me by mistake. It's a dangerous job, I told him, but somebody's gotta do it. July 28th, three things I don't like about being worm. One, I can't chew gum. Two, I can't have a dog. Three, all that homework. July 29th, three good things about being a worm. One, I never have to go to a dentist. Two, I never get in trouble for tracking mud through the house. And three, I never have to take a bath. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? August 1st, it's not always being a worm. We're very small and sometimes people forget that we're even here. But like mom always says, earth never forgets we're here. All right, so that's just kind of a cute little story that shows what it might, like, um, might be like to be a worm. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and try and share my screen again, and get it on the right. There we go. You guys can see it okay? All right. So today we're going to spend a little bit more time um, focusing on red worms and not necessarily the earthworms um, that you'll that you likely found when you dug through the soil. Um, red worms are what you're going to use for composting and we'll talk about that towards the end. So if you're interested in learning more about how to compost with worms, um, we will give you a lesson on that. Um, but composting is where things like leaves and food scraps and grass get broken down. Um, then the worms use that to make the soil full of nutrients that help the soil grow. Um, and then they, these red worms leave castings, which um, another word for that, really it's just worm poop, um, but that helps Im improve the texture and fertilizing power of the soil. Um, so we're gonna learn about worm parts a little bit today um, because if you are interested in learning more about things like jumping worms and those earthworms that might be harmful to our soil, um, you can do that because there's scientists and researchers at the University of Minnesota um, that have asked for people's help in reporting where, where jumping worms are found. Um, so that way they can come up with a solution to help um, minimize these jumping worms. Um, and so today we're going to look at parts a little, little bit because um, knowing different worm parts are helpful um, in knowing what kind of worm you're working with. Um, so if you were able to find, oh, I should have mentioned to you, sorry. Um, if you are interested in learning more about jumping worms and how earthworms are invasive species, um, there's a few websites on here and we can chat those out as well. Um, I don't think you'll be able to click on the screen and get to them, but we can put them in the chat um, as we go through and then you can um, look into this. It's a program called Citizen Science where um, people in Minnesota help help our researchers at the University of Minnesota solve problems. Um, so that's an in, that's an um, an option for you if you're interested in in learning more and doing doing more to help. All right. Now, if you have found your worm, um, chances are the worm that you found is probably an earthworm, and that's okay. They're around, um, but you can pick it up if you're comfortable. Callie, if you want to show your worm, she does have a red worm here. Um, so that way, if you don't have a worm, here's our little red worm on the screen, okay? Um, so if you have a little bit of dirt on your paper plate, you can um, give your worm a little dirt and spend a little bit of time with your magnifying glass looking at it um, and let, let us know what you see. Or, you know, if you're watching with somebody else, you can just tell them what you see with the worm. I'm gonna tilt my screen down for a little bit so you can see our worms. There we go. We got one kind of crawling around there. Amy, any um, hints if people don't have a magnifying glass, what they could do? You know, they could maybe just look a little bit closer at it. Um, if they're comfortable picking it up or getting their face right close to the worm, um, that will work just fine. Yep. 
um, and our magnifying glass isn't anything spectacular either, so it doesn't help a ton either. Um, but you can probably see the different segments. Um, worms have a head end and a tail end, um, just like we do. We have a head end and a tail end. They have a mouth. Um, we also have mouths as humans. Um, but worms have a few, um, well, a lot of things that humans don't have. Um, first of all, you can probably see the segments, those, all those little different pieces in the worms. Um, those segments are what help the worm move. So because they have all these tiny little pieces, they can pick which pieces are going to move, um, and that helps them kind of inch along. If they didn't have all those segments, they wouldn't be able to move or they would just, they'd be like this. Um, so they need those little sections to help them move kind of that up and down motion. And that's what helps them dig into the soil as well. Um, maybe if you've picked up your worm, um, you can tell, how does it feel? It probably feels a little bit on the slimy side. And that's because, um, again, worms don't have lungs, so they have to breathe through their skin. And so they need things moist and damp. And so that moist um, feeling, that slimy feeling, that actually helps them breathe. So it's good that they're slimy because that means they're breathing. Okay. Um, then there's also what's called the clitellum, or some, some people refer to it as the saddle. Um, and that's what the worms, um, that helps them make other worms. Um, so that's kind of an interesting part as well. Um, one thing about the jumping worms um, that are harmful is that their clitellum is a little bit lower on their body. Um, so they, that's one way that you can identify if it's a jumping worm or not is based on where that clitellum is. Um, and then um, one thing you don't see on here, because I didn't show a picture of the inside, but it's interesting that worms have five hearts. Um, humans, we only have one heart and it's got four, four separate chambers that all kind of work differently. But with worms, they have five hearts. Um, their hearts aren't broken into sections like ours are, um, but it just kind of squeezes and contracts that blood um, to help the blood move through the body. Um, but it's pretty interesting that worms have five hearts. Um, Sometimes um, people think that if you split a worm in half, you can grow two new worms. Um, that's not entirely true. Um, if you would cut a worm in half, um, the head could survive. If it was cut um, behind the clitellum and it would grow kind of a new tail end, but that tail end that was cut off won't be able to grow a new head end or um, new vital, new organs that they need to live. So we don't want you to go, go around um, chopping worms up just to try and get them to make more worms. Um, it's not gonna work that way. Um, if you happen to have a ruler and a worm, you can go ahead and measure and see how long your worm is. Um, Callie's gonna measure hers and we can, why don't you put your plate up here? Please be gentle with your worms. You don't need to pull and um, unnecessarily handle them if you don't need to. But if you want to put your worm up here, Cal, you can kind of get a measurement and see how long it is. I think ours is about four. So if you're able to get a measurement on your worm, you can put that in the chat box. About three. Three and a half. Three and a half we've got for our worm today. And I think, you know, if you would do this experiment again later on in the summer, you might find that your worms have gotten a lot longer and a lot fatter because they've been uh, munching on things all summer long and have had a chance to fatten up. All right, we'll give people another second to finish measuring their worm. All right, so, um, after the webinar is over, if you guys wanted uh, to um, do just a simple experiment, um, you can look at three different spots in your yard. So maybe find a, a spot that's, you know, more sunny um, and not as shaded. Maybe another spot that has a lot of grass or a lot of leaves. Um, and another spot that might be a little bit more on the damp side. And just dig around in the dirt a little bit and see if you notice um, the amount of worms. If there's more worms in one spot than in another spot. Um, so that's kind of a something you can do just to see where the worms might live and why they might live in different spots and not in others. All right. Any questions so far that we need to answer? Or? I've got a few, Amy, and I saw okay. a lot of variance in um, worm length. 
Okay. Anywhere from two inches to 12 inches. So wow. That's a, a lot of variation, but I've got about three questions if you want to try a couple here. Sure. I will um, do my best. Are earthworms the same as night crawlers? I believe that night crawlers are a kind of earthworm. Um, and so, yep, we like to use night crawlers and earthworms and things for fishing. Um, and that's totally okay. Um, we just have to make sure that we're not transporting them and leaving them in other spots. Um, I know when I was doing some research into you know, um, why earthworms might be bad, that they had recommended, you know, when you're done, if you get bait that are night crawlers, um, when you're done fishing, if you don't use all of it, they don't want you to dump them in the woods. Um, a better option would be to dispose of them in the trash. Great, thanks for the suggestions. Um, another one is how can worms open their mouths? That is a great question. Um, I don't know that answer, but you know, it would make a very interesting fair project to uh, study a little bit more about worms and those different anatomy parts and see how their body operates and how it's different from ours. But that's a great question. Way to stump me. Well, and I was going to say too, we can also collect your questions and put a question and answer sheet and find the answers and put them on the website as well. So um, a couple more, then I'll let you back to your presentation. Um, why do they have stripes? Uh, the stripes would be what are called those segments. So the, those again are those sections of the worm um, that helps it move in that wiggly, creepy, crawly way. Um, so it's not really stripes, it's more just the different individual segments of the worm there. And then the last one is, what is the saddle? Um, the saddle, that clitellum is what it's called, um, and that's used for, um, they can make their egg sac in there and then they kind of shed the egg sac from that clitellum, so that helps with making baby worms. Another one is, um, what do worms usually eat, Amy? Okay, so um, worms eat a lot of different things. Um, they like, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what Callie's red worms like to eat, um, but worms like your earthworms that you find outside, um, they like to eat things like grass and leaf parts. Um, the, with um, the things like the jumping worms and those earthworms that maybe aren't the best, they like to eat a lot of um, you know leaves and things that might be left like on the floor of a forest. Um, and then that causes a problem because then our forests don't necessarily grow the way they should with that undergrowth. Um, so a lot of plant matter and things like that are, is getting destroyed by some of those jumping worms and, and earthworms. So they like plants, they are not, um, meat eaters by any means they're vegetarian so we'll talk about that a little bit more when we show you our worm farm we got going on here at the nelson house all right so um yep we can bring it on over this is callie can you say hi callie um, she is a member of Steel County 4-H and has kind of always had an interest in worms so um, because of this interest in worms um, this has led us to newly become worm farmers. Um, so we're gonna show you the worm farm and tell you how you can build your own um, worm farm if you're interested in this. Um, again, I wanna say that if this is something that doesn't interest you, please don't build one just for the sake of building one. Um, they, they are, you know, um, living, breathing creatures, so we want to be respectful of them. Um, and so building a worm farm is something you can do if you're interested in um, compost and, you know, using that, what they eat for fertilizer and growing some of your vegetables and herbs and things like that. Um, so there definitely is a purpose for building this. Um, so I want to caution you that if um, don't just build one just for the sake of building one. If you want to build one, build one because you're going to use the compost and really want to use it for um, some learning, which is what we're going to try and do here. Um, but if you're going to build your own worm farm, there's some things that you need. Um, first of all, you want the red composting worms. Um, you definitely don't want to go outside and just dig up the earthworms that you find. Um, they're not good composters. Um, you need the red composting worms and you can get them from, um, there's many, you know, credible places online where you can get the red composting worms. Um, 
and you want to make sure that when you get your worms that they just contain the red composting worms. So, you know, um, ours came in a bag and kind of all balled up. So we checked around to make sure there wasn't any of those jumping worms and things like that in there. Um, so you want to make sure you're getting your worms from a, a good source. Um, again, you want the red composting worms. They're shorter um, and they're red, obviously, and they'll tend to stay a little bit closer to the surface um, of the earth. They don't burrow way deep down um, like the regular earthworms will. Um, redworms are also good for composting because they eat a lot. Um, they eat a lot more, I think, than some of our earthworms. They've been known to eat up to their weight a day. So if this worm weighs an ounce, which is probably a little on the heavy side, but it's gonna eat an ounce. Um, so they do eat a lot. Um, so that's what makes them good composters as well is because they eat a lot. Um, another thing that you want, you can see that we have ours in a Rubbermaid tote or a, um, you know, some sort of transparent container. Um, you can use glass jars, uh, uh, plastic drink jugs, milk jugs, small aquariums, um, but you do need to have a source of air for them um, and a source, um, you get, We'll talk a little bit about the moisture, but again, since they don't have those lungs to breathe and they breathe through their skin, um, the air holes are very important to make sure the, the oxygen is getting into the, the ground for them. Um, we also have drainage holes on our bottom. Um, this is just so that way as things start to function in there, um, there's going to be a little bit of drainage and we don't want that to stay inside. Otherwise, we could get all moldy in here. Um, and then also sometimes um, worm farms don't always work out the way they should. Um, and so then the um, drainage holes kind of give those worms also an out. So if something would happen to go wrong in your container, then the worms have an out so they can go live um, a happy life in the soil. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but we still want those holes in there for drainage and for air. Um, another thing that you want is bedding. You can use um, garden soil layered with sand um, or shredded newspaper and cardboard. I don't know how well you can see ours, um, but you can see those little chunks of paper in there. So we just um, kind of cut up some newspaper and some recycled paper and layered it with um, the, the garden soil. Um, and so it's just layers and they will kind of start to decompose and chew through that paper um, and make their castings that way. Um, and when we put the paper in, what did we do to it? Do you remember what we did, Kelly? Got it wet. We got it wet. Not super damp, um, but just enough that it kind of felt like a, a damp sponge so it wasn't dripping water. Um, but that moisture again is important for our little worm creatures so that way they can um, breathe through that. Um, so we just layered the paper, the soil, the paper, the soil, um, and made sure our paper was damp as we put it in there. Um, and then our final step, well, one of the final steps was to put some food scraps in there. So like I said, worms are, are vegetarian, so they like to eat plants and not so much meat. Um, so there's certain things you can put in your compost bin to feed your worms and things you don't want to feed them. Um, they like things like eggshells, fruit peels, um, coffee grounds, grass, gra old plants, grass clippings, leaves, that kind of thing. Um, you don't want to put things like meat or dairy products in there um, because that thing, that will spoil and they don't like to eat rotten food like that. Um, they also don't do well with bread and cheese. So you want to keep it um, um, things, you know, like coffee grounds and eggshells, some fruit Sorry. peels. Um, a few places that we read about it had said to avoid things like citrus, so oranges and lemons. Um, they don't like that citrus or spicy or salty things. Um, so just coffee grounds, grass peels, eggs. Strawberries. Stra yep, we've got some strawberry tops in there for them. Um, things like that. All right. Um, and now once we keep ours outside, some people keep their compost bins in their house in a dark, cool place like a basement or maybe a cupboard. Um, we're not really fans of keeping it in our house. We like to keep it outside. Um, but since worms don't like light, um, we have been keeping it covered with either some black paper or um, cardboard, something to keep that light out. So that way um, worms can't live very long if they're exposed to light, I think about an hour. Um, 
was what they have in the light um, before they start to die. So we keep it covered um, just so they can do their thing. We certainly, um, you're okay to take the paper off and check and see what's happening in there um, and you know feed them, but then you wanna cover it back up so that they have that dark environment to uh, do their, their composting in. Okay. Um, so it's pretty simple to build. Um, it is going to take us a while to start to see the compost where we can pull out the compost and um, use it. Sorry. Um, I'll go back there a little bit. Um, I think it, some sources have said it's going to be about six months before we have compost that we can actually use. Um, but once we have compost that we can pull out of here, um, we can add it to, you know, our garden or um, different plants that we're growing or house plants or fruits and vegetables to help our um, plants grow a little bit better. The compost um, is really rich in nutrients that plants um, like so that's what that's why people do it is to help kind of fertilize their their plants and things like that um, it's a good way to dispose of some of those leftover food scraps in a responsible manner um, so that way we're not throwing things in the trash we're using it and um, building kind of a sustainable environment here with our worm farm all right um, any other questions that have come in we have all sorts of questions, Amy. Um, my first one is when you're looking at um, the red worms on the internet, like how many did you get for Callie's farm? I think they come in all sorts of sizes. Yep, Callie says there's a hundred. So um, I think we just got a smaller bag with a hundred that was in it. Um, I think you can get, you know, even up to a thousand. Um, since this was our first go at it, we wanted to try it simple and said, thought, you know, we'll start with a hundred. Um, hopefully if things work right, as we go along, there might be more worms that end up in here as we go along. Um, some people, when they pull their compost out, will leave the worms with it and go, you know, trans, um, put it with their plants. Other times people will put, pick the worms out and put it back with their bin. It just depends on, you know, how they, um, how they want to keep. Yep. Um, and worms, the red worms aren't is what they call hardy. So they're not as, you know, strong. Um, they don't like cold Minnesota winters. So um, if you do start one, you might have to bring it indoors somewhere um, during the winter months um, just to keep your worms alive. Um, so, oh, yep. Um, you talked about jumping worms. Do the jumping worms actually jump? They, I don't know if they actually jump, but their movement is different where it's more snake-like, where they kind of slither along and not so much the inching like some of our other worms do. Okay. Um, another, I'll combine a couple of these. They're similar. Like how far down can an earthworm burrow? Um, I don't know the exact feet, um, and we can put this on a question document. I know they will go down as deep as they can if they don't like the conditions that they have. So they will go, you know, maybe six, ten feet down um, if the soil is favorable there and they like that soil better than the soil that's six, eight, ten inches from the ground. Um, we have lots of questions on, do you know anything about the reproduction of worms, how old they are, how we know what we have? That is one thing that I really didn't look into too much. We were kind of focused more on the benefits of composting and how we can use worms in a good manner. Um, but again, that would make an excellent fair project that you project. can start doing some research on how that all works and um, yeah. Yep, you can. Um, another question about your bin, how big is your container about? I think this one is just a 27 quart container. Um, you can do something as small as like a milk jug or a two liter plastic pop bottle. Um, you know, one of those totes that are more shoebox size, those work as well. Um, you know, the bigger you have, the more stuff you're gonna have to add to it. So again, since we're just starting our um, worm farm journey, we started a little bit more on the smaller side. Amy, I don't know if you get any royalties from this, but there was a question, where do you purchase red worms? Um, we do get royalties, but maybe if this takes off, that's something we can look into. Um, we got ours from Amazon. Um, you wanna make sure that it's a credible source. Um, again, don't just go dig out and get your earthworms. Um, there may be some bait shops that sell them, but a simple internet search for you know, red worms um, from a credible source will, will probably get you what you need. 
And again, um, you know, if you're not 100% sure if it's a credible source where you're getting your worms from, a good um, way is to do a little bit of research and see what those jumping worms look like compared to what the um, red worms, what the red worms look like. And then just check around before you put them in your bin to make sure that, yep, these are indeed red worms that we're putting in there. Here's kind of a, oh, I just lost it. Uh, okay, uh, do we need, need to use a clear bin or can we use a colored bin? You could use a colored bin, certainly. Um, we use a clear bin just so we can see and observe what's happening in there. Um, if you use a colored bin, then you don't have to worry so much about keeping it covered or keeping it dark because the bin is gonna naturally do that. Um, but we wanted to be able to see. So if you wanna be able to see, I would recommend more of a clear container. Um, but if you don't really care what's happening in there, or you know what's happening in there, and you just want the compost, uh, a um, colored bin would work fine too. I found the question I like from Emma. Uh, what kind of animal is a worm? Um, I'm not remembering specifically. I know it's called what's called the. I don't even. That's a good question. Um, I would recommend that you look into that, and um, that would also be another good good fair project is to see what animal group that would fall into, yeah. and um, some characteristics of that group. Are you seeing any other ones, Brian? No, uh, there's a lot, but um, I think you hit the big ones. Um, and like Amy said, we can do probably a question and answer sheet and attach it to our website um, to try to get to all of your questions um, when we're done. All right. Um, and I'll give you a few, you know, fair exhibit ideas. We've talked about some of them. So if you're interested in learning more about worms, um, you know, some good projects would be to do some research and see why maybe things like the jumping worms and the earthworms, you know, what kind of damage they do and why we don't want them. Um, the University of Minnesota Extension and our Minnesota Department of Natural Resource has some good information out there that you can find on that. Um, so that would make a really neat fair project and kind of interesting. Um, one that is educational as well to the public who may come to the fair because um, you know we want our exhibits to be educational and that might be something that a lot of people don't know you know when we think of invasive species we think about you know our zebra mussels and our things that cling to our boat but you know there's more than that too and worms are one of them so how can we be responsible citizens um, when it comes to worms that's a good fair project um, we had talked about maybe once we start getting some compost, doing some comparison of how plants grow in soil that has the compost and how it grows in soil that doesn't um, have compost. Um, if you decide to do a worm composting, a worm farm um, for compost, you could um, try out some different foods and see what kind of foods they prefer. Um, you know, maybe you place some strawberry tops in there and some egg shells and see which is gone first. Um, one thing I guess I forgot to talk about, um, you don't wanna keep feeding them. You wanna check your, your bin and make sure that what you've put in there is gone before you add more. Otherwise you're gonna get that moldy food in there and they won't necessarily eat that. So um, develop a feeding schedule. Um, if you decide to do a worm farm, a feeding schedule would also make kind of a neat fair exhibit where you show, you know, what you, what, when you're scheduled to feed them and what's your schedule to feed them. Um, you could do some worm stats. Maybe if you go and dig in your yard, if you don't want to build a worm, worm bin, um, but if you wanted to do more, some just natural exploration for what, what you have outside um, for worms, you know, you could dig in different spots and see um, how many worms you're finding in different areas of your yard um, and then do some stats, you know, take their, take their measurements like we did today um, and kind of put together a little stat booklet about worms where they live. Maybe there's bigger worms in the garden than there are under rocks. Um, that would be kind of an interesting thing to do as well. Um, any other questions or? Amy, as you're talking about bringing a fair project, like what area, what project area would you probably put something like that in, do you think? That is a good question. I would say um, probably, it would probably be more that plant and soil science. Um, a worm, you know, there's that entomology projects, but that's more for insects. Um, and a worm really isn't an insect. So I would say it would probably fit better into that plant and soil science area um, of, of the different categories that there are. 
Um, Elias said that uh, worms are invertebrates. That's the type of animal they are. And then I also looked and um, we had, they're called annelids. Worms. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys. Yeah, so it's, it's easy to find some answers and some answers you have to dig a little harder for, but thank you for, now we know they're invertebrates and they're in the annelid family. So thank you. Um, there's tons of questions in here, but I think some of them we'll put in a document. But I, one I wanted to pull out is, do you know where um, we heard that red worms can't live outside here probably? Where do they, where do you find red worms? Where do they live? Um, I would say if you're going to get them for the sake of doing composting, um, probably again trying to find that credible source, whether it's Amazon or, you know, there might be some garden supply stores, things like that, that would have them. Um, but they probably live in the southern United States. Yeah. It's a little warmer. Yep. I was going to say too, if you have a greenhouse in your area, they might be able to, to get you the worms that you need or a bait shop, things like that. Very cool. But they do, yep, I would imagine they'd probably have to go to a warmer climate to, to find well, We them. have about 20 more questions that we'll answer in the document and we'll send out with our links to the kids. So look for that um, tomorrow. Sounds good. Um, and then I'll give just a quick reminder, next week, our next agronomy session that we have coming up is Garden Tip Tuesday. So that'll be on Tuesday, May 5th. Um, and we're gonna give you some garden tips. So if you're interested in gardening, um, that's what next Tuesday will be for. Um, I don't know yet if it's gonna be more vegetable gardening, flower gardening, herb gardening, what kind of gardening we got going on. Maybe it's all of them. Um, so come and learn um, about gardening with us next Tuesday um, at two o'clock, two, so Tuesday, May 5th. Um, I see we've got the, the poll up there now, so you can go ahead and start putting your answers in. Um, we appreciate you guys giving us your feedback. That's helpful as we plan our next agronomy sessions. Well, thank you, Amy, for teaching us so much about worms. Yeah, we've, we've been learning a lot here about them as well. So hopefully our compost works and we're able to use it to grow some yummy vegetables yeah. and plants. Brian, in the chat, there's a question maybe you would know the answer to. What email would they get? Would it go to the email they registered with? They would, yes. Yeah. So we'll be sending um, the question and the answer sheet to you as well as an information for, as Amy said, for next week for our gardening tips. So uh, watch for that. Um, or you can always just go to the 4-H Agronomy website, um, just wwwmen 4 h Agronomy, and you can go and see the recordings and see the answers and see our, our other recordings we've done um, throughout the last few weeks. Awesome. I'm gonna have to check out the question and answer sheet because I'm curious about a few of these. <laughs> We're always learning, aren't we? Yes. Uh, can we post the website? Yep, I'll copy that right now. And um... So thank you all for joining. This is uh, the end. Thanks, Amy, for, as, as Kirsten said, for leading our session today. And we hope to see you all next week. So after you finish out the, the poll, our time is done today. So thanks for joining.